So the, the answer of the allopathic medicine was, we'll just manage your symptoms. You're out of luck. That's your disease. You're going to die with it. Sylvia, how did you find carnival? Uh, how did I find it? You know what? I was, um, for a while, I was following all the influencers in the low carb world. And, you know, it was such a uh, evolution of the movement from low carb to keto to zero carb. And then all of a sudden, those carnivore people started coming to those conferences. So one of the people that I found very interesting was Dr. Sofia Clemens from the clinic in Hungary, Paleo Medicina. And her twist on the carnivore diet was paleo ketogenic diet. And so it was a carnivore diet with ketosis, with a restriction of proteins and a ratio of fat to proteins two to one, and with a weekly consumption of organ meats. And that really spoke to me. And then she was actually addressing in one of those conferences chronic disease. And I believe her case study was rheumatoid arthritis. And that's what I was dealing with at the time. So um, I contacted the clinic in Hungary. Uh, at that time, they were doing uh, the PEG 400 tests. So that was the gut permeability test with uh, this uh, interesting solution, sugar alcohol with like 11 different sizes of molecules and you drink it. And then however many of those molecules make it to your blood will give you the level of uh, gut permeability. And mine was through the roof where normal was somewhere here. My gut permeability was like somewhere there. So um, that was a good enough for me uh, um, painting to get to, like, let's do it. Let's do this diet. Um, while I was waiting for the results of the test, uh, I decided to quit coffee because I know that that was going to be a uh, part of the part of the diet. So I first suffered through coffee withdrawals and I sort of got myself in ready for the diet itself, which looked like a very uh, challenging and you had to be really like hundred percent austerity and really disciplined to make it work. At least I was committed to make it, make it a hundred percent accurate with all the ratios, with all the organ meats and, and, and ratios of the fat to proteins. So I first started giving up different uh, groups of food. Um, then I started giving up coffee and tea, and then I was down to uh, dairy meat, eggs, butter, animal fats, and then I just turn it up to make it 100% paleo ketogenic compliant. And in about 10 days, 85% of my symptoms went away. Like I was able to start walking with, uh, without pain. And my rheumatoid arthritis was everywhere but in my spine. So just about every joint, including my jaws, and sometimes between my ribs were affected. All, my, all the joints of my feet, my ankles, my knees, my hips, my shoulders, thing, every single finger, uh, finger joint was affected. Uh, and yeah, the recovery was super speedy. I, I could not believe it. I mean, I've been walking. At that time, it was, it was at least five years that I had chronic pain and I could not take a step without feeling pain. <laughs> it's just in 10 days, gone. <laughs> and then I thought there was more to it. So I was like, you know what? You know, the good news, you gotta tell people. So I started uh, recording videos on YouTube, however bad quality they were. I was like, oh, I'm just gonna talk about it because this is amazing. <laughs> Um, and then I thought, well, maybe I shouldn't just do my own experience because this is just one person. So um, I connected with uh, Sean Baker. That back then it was uh, Meet RX, and I got trained as a carnivore diet coach. They were they had this whole program and started coaching on his platform. That then got discontinued, but I was already I wrote my own program and had my own platform where uh, when people wanted specific more relationship-based coaching, I was doing that. And the rest is a history. Well, congratulations. That's awesome. And, you know, it, it's a testament to this way of eating that, uh, you know, you can get results in just basically days after starting, right? 
Um, yeah, it's the the question of gut permeability is you know the 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 the, the blessing in disguise is that the uh, gut cells uh, re recover in about twenty eight days. So to uh, restore the gut integrate inter integrity is relatively fast. Now, depending on the history and the genetic blueprint, the retraining of the immune system and its behaviors, that may take longer. But yeah, in principle, uh, the recovery from uh, damage, leaky gut happens very quickly. Maybe I should add also that the, the basic premise of the paleo ketogenic diet and the, and the philosophy of the paleo medicina was that uh, all um, autoimmune diseases uh, result from increased gut permeability. And so you focus on addressing of sealing of your gut wall versus addressing immune system or your joints. Like just to take a step back, um, what kind of got you interested in looking into low carb and keto and that kind of thing before uh, initially? So before you you found out anything about um, Sophia Clements um, and you were just trying the different diets. Um, what kind of pushed you in that direction? I was always interested in natural ways of healing. Uh, I grew up uh, in Poland and that was during the peak communism. So there was no such a thing like um, modern healthcare. And all we knew was like uh, folk remedies, tr remedies, traditional remedies. Um, even if you got to the doctor, the doctors themselves were employing more natural approaches to healing. And I remember like sometimes if we would go to like a, a village healers, like one of the things that they would uh, make us use as a remedy was drinking animal fats with different concoctions in it. So there would be like, let's say, um, usually they would make you hunt for a wild animal and uh, render fat from that animal and then add that fat either to milk with some additional herbs and that would be a majority of uh, remedies. And so I grew up seeing it. My, my aunt uh, was a herbalist. Uh, my father has in, in, the, uh, in the attic, there was a whole bunch of dried herbs. So th that, that was the world I knew. And when I moved to the United States, you know, when I had my phase of like, you know, going crazy for the modernity and the city and everything. And then I made a rapid turn. I was like, let me get back to the roots, what I knew worked and how it was. And I was always interested in the natural way of healing. Like really, the, I understood that to be healthy, you have to strengthen the whole body. You don't go after a specific organ. You really have to address the body holistically as an entire unit. And with the Western medicine, this just isn't a, a just isn't the philosophy. When I went to a, um, a allopathic doctor, what I heard was, well, there's nothing we can do about your condition. We can give you methotrexate. Um, it will take away pain, but it will damage your liver. So on average, you will live shorter by 17 years. That's, that is the standard protocol. Now, if you want to try a little lighter, you can start with, um, you know, uh, Tylenol. They start with Tylenol, then they give you high dose Tylenol that doesn't work. Then you get onto hydroxychloroquine and then methotrexate. And now we have different variations of all kinds of drugs, but the, the, they all work the same in different ways. They suppress immune system, the expression of the immune system. So the, the answer of the allopathic medicine was, we'll just manage your symptoms and that's you're out of luck. That's your disease. You're going to die with it. Hmm. It's a pretty sad indictment really mm -hmm. that, um, you know, as, medicine kind of improves or, or you know technology improves you know we're going down the road of not not actually you know fixing any problems just managing things right yeah as i as i did uh, some research into the uh, western medicine it derived from emergency me emergency medicine majority of the western medical approaches was developed during the wars so it was, you know, take a, take a wounded soldier, patch them up, stitch them up, and put them, you know, put them back into the to combat. Now that's okay if you break your leg, if you have like some, you know, open wound, but uh, diseases that uh, originate from uh, lifestyle and um, a poor diet, poor dietary choices, 
or even things like bad ma emotion management can result in, in a chronic disease. Um, yeah, you cannot take a pill for it. You have to get to the root cause and address it at the root cause. And carnivore diet has that potential because just to use the example of autoimmune conditions, so we have over 200 of them and there is every day there's a new one that gets developed. They all originate in the leaky gut where you know things that should not get into our bloodstream get into our bloodstream and they interact in the immune system. And then depending on your uh, uh, genetic blueprint, yeah, maybe, uh, you know, immune system will get sensitive towards your joint tissue. As I understand what happens with different expressions of autoimmunity, uh, those undigested proteins and fragments of bacteria attach to different uh, tissues and they engage in something called a molecular mimic mimicry. So immune system sees it as uh, your own uh, cells because that protein or part of bacteria is attached to it, sees it as one unit and develops antibody to the whole thing. And that's how autoimmune uh, conditions are diagnosed. And it is also sort of a um, really unhelpful way of looking at autoimmunity because it, it, even holistic doctors will tell you, you know, your own body attacks you. And then you're like, what, what, what am I supposed to do? Like, how, how, how is it happening that I'm attacking myself? Like, <laughs> I don't have that bad of a relationship with myself. <laughs> like, what kind of thing is this? <laughs> how do you eat on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, I'm currently back to the PKD, um, quite strict. So I eat uh, twice a day for the most part. It's kind of a breakfast lunch in one. Uh, then I eat dinner. Mostly it's red meat. Mostly my fat, mostly tallow. Uh, I have eggs in my diet as well. Uh, I love bacon and lard as, uh, as well. Uh, occasionally butter. Um, salt. Uh, collagen powder. Bone broth. That's it. So I try to stay about 500 grams of meat and uh, double the amount. So uh, uh, rule of thumb, let's say five tablespoon of uh, added fat to, uh, to the meat that I'm eating. That kind of breakfast, lunch, that's kind of early afternoon? Yeah, typically between anywhere between 12 and 1. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have in the morning, typically I, I drink a raw egg yolk with collagen powder and warm water. So that's usually how I start my day. And I add also a tablespoon of tallow in it. In warm water, I blend it up and that's how I drink it. So that is my kind of like a liquid calorie breakfast, if you uh, want to look at it this way. It kind of looks, the texture is that of a, a latte. A flavor is sort of neutral, but uh, it makes me feel great. So I keep doing it. I was really addicted to coffee, more so to the ritual of it and just fact of having something hot in the morning, something with like creamy. And I was, I, I was looking for some sort of a replacement. So I just literally, that's what I invented. And it, it tastes especially delicious when you add some coffee to it. it it's really great. So for those of you that drink uh, coffee, you want to make it more carnivore, that is a great way of doing it. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, that, uh, ritualistic is a good way of describing it things like most addictions you know there's there's a very ritualistic part to it right whether it's coffee it's or smoking or drinking yeah it's a, it's a huge uh, emotional component to it um and, and you know most people drink coffee in like less when, when we arrive at the point of that we need to get on the carnival diet we are usually 20 years or 30 years into the habit so it, it is difficult to undo it uh, and uh, I would say probably the most challenging cases that uh, I deal with uh, as a carnival diet coach are the emotional eaters and people that are addicted to coffee and carbohydrates and processed foods in relation to um, coaching and the people you've worked with, when someone's when someone's getting started with carnivore, what are some of the the bigger challenges that they might face? Um, usually, is the compliance. Usually, is the compliance with the diet. Uh, in that, uh, a lot of people just you know life gets in the way. 
uh, bad habit, years years of bad habits, and uh, just just the fact that you have to get through the uh, valley of hell to you know free yourself from uh, carbohydrate cravings. That that period is usually challenging for many many people. So. Um, it typically happens it's the initial four weeks is okay fifth week but i noticed that between six and seven weeks of the carnival diet is almost like a, a sort of a relapse so even when you think that you're off the carbohydrate cravings of coffee cravings six seven sometimes eight weeks is when the when it kind of is sort of a relapse and then you have to have a, some sort of a coping strategy to last but that's where kind of a coaches are useful what are, what are some tricks you've found that can help people with with that compliance at the beginning? Uh, creating friction, so remove everything that could have um, that could have lead you to the to the fridge and, and eat your favorite snack, or don't have the foods that are not compliant with the carnival diet uh, at home. And if you have to, you know, break your commitment to the carnival diet, you have to you know get in the car and go somewhere. That delay between the desire and what you have to do to get to the food that you're not supposed to eat usually is enough to uh, to stop you from do, doing what you're not supposed to do. Um, stress is a very common thing that uh, uh, that causes um, people to break their uh, diet. Um, and that's unfortunately, you know, there's no good fixes because there are external uh, stresses that you can't control. You just have to uh, develop resilience. And when I get with clients to the point that, you know, I broke it because uh, this and that happened, uh, then, you know, the, the, the only thing you can do is to give support, get back in the saddle. It's OK. What's done, it's done. Let's develop a plan and let's develop a plan how to work around uh, the challenge because that will inevitably happen again. So that we look for a strategy, uh, either change of circumstances or how you will deal with a particular person or maybe take a break from attending certain things or going certain places. And that usually helps. Another thing is uh, when it comes to breaking of habits is uh, get yourself busy with something new. So uh, if you're fighting with something, altering of your schedule. So for example, if you identify that between four and six is the time that you'll, uh, that you'll crave foods, very good time to go to the gym, take a walk, um, organize something that does not involve eating with someone else. And it, it, that, that is probably the most useful thing to power through cravings. And another thing is what a lot of people that tried it, they'll, they'll figure it out on their own, is when you, the, the cravings ebb and flow. So they usually have the strongest grip on you in the first 20 minutes when you start, uh, when you start feeling them. And after that, they just lose uh, their power. And if you can power through, and most people from their own experience will start noticing it, then every... Uh, following craving is just weaker and weaker in intensity and then it's over that that is a really good thing to keep in mind the uh that it's only going to last for a window of about 20 minutes and then you know then yeah. it's going to be dissipate a lot have you ever have you ever worked with someone who just hasn't had results yes with carnival yes yes could you uh, talk a little bit about that yeah, there are uh, people, if they have taken a lot of medication for a really, really long time, particularly those uh, immunosuppressants, um, there are cases, not all, but it takes really long time for the carnivore diet to uh, make a dent. And sometimes it, I've had a client that, a couple clients, it took a one year and another client, and she had rheumatoid arthritis, and the other client had SIBO. It took eight to nine months, and many, many, many fa failures. And then finally, he contacted me. It, it happened. I healed. It, w it took eight to nine months. And SIBO too, typically, uh, relatively quickly, re responds to the carnival diet. And that case was like really relentless. And he was quite good with the diet, and you know, he was strict. He, he was. And it just just took a long time, but um, um, I noticed with some of the clients, 
when they have severe cases of autoimmunity, there's very strong autoimmune um, psychological component to it. That there's a lot of trauma that uh, comes with certain uh, autoimmune conditions and yeah, oftentimes the childhood trauma. And that takes a long time to address because there are not just um, uh, nutritional deficiencies and the lack of integrity of the gut wall, but there's also this, this the very damage, the insight and a kind of self-hatred. And then it's just that that to tackle that all together, it's, it's much more challenging and takes a long time. It's sad to say, but emotional healing takes a lot longer than, than actually uh, di di uh, dietary changes and to see those effects. Mm. But um, uh, as long as I've been doing it, so it's almost four or five years, uh, one thing is for sure, uh, mm, the appropriate human diet is as little carb car carbohydrate as possible. I'm not saying don't eat any carbohydrates if you don't need to, but the current trajectory, huma trajectory that the humanity is on, uh, carbohydrates, morning, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and snacks in between, uh, that is not the way to go. That is a guaranteed uh that is a guaranteed um chronic disease oftentimes metabolic in nature at around age of 35 to 40 there are major manifestations of chronic disease if if, if we continue yeah there's more and more younger people that i've noticed that are uh, coming down with things like autoimmunity uh even things like um Diabetic, diabetic, pre-diabetic. It's just like uh, I've I've had a client that was twenty nine years old with diabetes. Speaking of that, I noticed uh, a post on Twitter today that um, or X that uh, was President Biden talking about uh, you know how there's something called shrinkflation. And all the like potato chips and, and Oreos and and all this kind of thing, you know, the price is the same, but the the uh, the the sizes are getting smaller. And um, the like he was talking about how I'm not going to stand for this, or where you know we've had enough of this, or whatever. And I, I was just thinking, that's you know that's the least of our problems you know like taking the issue to the food companies you know and this is not a political thing it's just like this is the least of our problems it's just this is we we shouldn't be eating the stuff in the first place correct correct and we have a lot bigger problem uh, as, a, as, a, as a humanity as a global population we have a lot bigger problem in that there's a very uh, poor understanding of what uh, nutrition is, what a good diet is, because there's been so much erosion of traditional ways of eating, and there's this constant uh, bombardment with uh, plant-based this, plant-based that, that people don't know. P people really don't know what, what constitutes a, a healthy diet. And I see it in my workplace that uh, a, a lunch of choice is, is, is some kale salad with a bunch of seeds and nuts with like a tiny amount of feta cheese, maybe some uh, a couple pieces of chicken and, and, you know, swimming in the olive oil. But we all know that the olive oil have a canola oil added in it. And, and, and then a few some other f maybe pieces of fruit, like some caramelized uh, pear. And, and that, that's, a, that's a nutritious lunch. That is considered a nutritious uh, lunch. Uh, or I see uh, coworkers like scanning, there's an application that you can scan um, the content of bars, snack bars. Okay, should you be even eating it in the first place, like as an option for lunch? You know, and the conversation revolves around, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this has this much sodium, <laughs> no matter everything else, but this one has a little bit too much sodium, so I'm not eating it. Um, it there's also a conversation I, I hear on the on, in the playground where mother will be discussing an option switching from uh, regular milk to almond milk because my child is lactose intoler intolerant. I mean, there's no such a thing as almond milk. No plant milk is a milk. It may have a color of milk, but that's where it ends. Similar, that's where the similarities end. And 
even pediatricians, I was actually trying to convince someone in the playground that <laughs> maybe a raw milk, A2 from the farm is a better option if there is lactose intolerance. And the pediatrician herself recommended cashew milk as, an, as a reasonable alternative. So uh, you're lactose intolerant. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll take the milk out of your diet. Instead, we'll, we'll give you some poison. And, uh, right. you know, that, I'm sure that's going to be much better for you. <laughs> right. We will give you cashew, cashews that if you eat them raw would poison you. In your workplace, when you see that, the sad thing is that, as you say, it's seen as nutritious. These people think they're doing the right thing, right? Everyone thinks right. they're doing I've got this big salad and it's got only a little bit of fat in there and a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And I've got my olive oil on it. It's, it's great, you know. I can't. I can't understand putting on weight or I can't understand. Um, so those people, when they're seeing you eating, you know, what's their reaction to your way of eating? Oh, there's all sort of jokes. <laughs> uh, but you know what? I am able to influence people. Like there the, are the people that are uh, beginning to select more red meat for their diet. Um, I was advocating very, very strongly my uh, my team to do a carnivore um, month in January. Uh, some people went as far as doing low carb, but even that is is definitely a move in the right direction. Um, yeah, I, I advocate a lot of my uh, work. Like, don't get chicken, get steak, get pork chop, get something that has red meat, has those amino acids that really improve your cognitive function. That is really what you need. Another thing is that is almost insurmountable is this belief in olive oil and coconut oil. And saturated fat is what lines our brains. We evolved eating fat. And even if you look at the distribution of IQ across the people that eat saturated fat do better than where there is a high consumption of plant oils. And let's say, Okay, technically olive oil and coconut oil are fruit oils, but they're still inferior to animal saturated fats that is almost identical to what our brain needs. And if you look at the behavior of the population, if they eat according to their traditional diet, it, it, the performance is noticeable. And again, if I say to people that I cook in lard in tallow, I kid you not, people will ask me, what is tallow? When, when I think about lard and tallow, I, when I was a kid, that's what we had for cooking with, you know, like that was always what was in the kitchen. And then at some point, it was in the 90s or something, at some point, then there was the, um, you know, the spray on oils that you would get from the fry pan and uh, spray into the fry pan. And then, you know, it was then you can't use the sprays anymore. So um, then that changed to uh, olive oil and vegetable oils and, and stuff. And yeah, it's just Same here. gone downhill. Mm. Same here. My, uh, my, my father had a ranch, so he was uh, raising, uh, raising pigs and sheep and cows so did my uh, neighbors and you you couldn't extract we had sunflowers but you couldn't there was no technology to extract oil from sunflowers and in what quantities too you would have to have fields and fields of them right whereas you you uh, you slaughter a single uh, pig the whole family of four eats for months and months and you know it's really sustainable and you know, if anybody saw uh, how a lard is made, you just basically take the skin of the animal and just let it warm it up, heat it up on the pan, and you have lard. That that is the technology needed. A little bit of fire and some, uh, you know, some pot to store the fat, and that's it. Whereas, like, if you look at the processes of making uh, of making seed oils, the traditional cultures just didn't have the technology to do it, and they weren't eating it. Even in very, very warm climates, there just wasn't a thing because you couldn't do it. You needed really large quantities of fat, you needed really uh, of uh, seeds, and uh, advanced technology to squeeze them and extract them, and then process them to something that is edible. I think when you think about the, the seed oils, when you think about all the processed foods and, you know, the the alternatives that are coming out now and all this kind of thing, 
we the way we would traditionally have eaten um we've suddenly gone no 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 we need to change that we need to manage our health we need to make sure we're eating particular things we need to manage this and when we've taken control and started to manage things that's when the it's gone off the rails that's when we've started to get sicker and sicker and sicker and sicker right and uh i, I would say there's something that we have to overcome collectively there's also this um this over reliance on third party authorities this this this, this um authority structure that they decide what we should be eating how we should be eating depending on you know uh, interested parties that want to pursue certain things for profit and uh, we have a, a i think collectively as as a, as a people we have this illusion that there are those um nutritional recommendations are in any way uh, related to what the proper human diet should be and it's all driven by other things such as profit um and not by what's appropriate uh, human diet no that that is the least of the focus it is just what can sell and at the at the maximum margins um and and i think partly that's why we have this uh, huge push for a plant uh, plant based uh, foods because you can make them cheaply in large quantities ship them around the world and they have long shelf life if you have a population that eats a meat based diet let's say let's just say 80% of the diet is meat based it's going to be it's going to be a culture and an economy of small farms small vendors people uh, selling to each other because you cannot ship that stuff you cannot ship pork or steak around the world processes in another country and sell it in another country and have it on the shelf for 6 months that is just not going to happen and so 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 large corporations just don't no, don't have an interest there's no business model for them to pursue there and that's why it's not a part of the uh, official education uh, education about nutrition can you can you tell me for yourself um in the last 4 or 5 years practically day to day how is your li- we've already talked about arthritis and stuff but practically day to day how has your life changed because of it so this way right um well there were many different things that i wasn't aware of, that i that i that i thought was just part of my life that that was just that that's what it is i had um a chronic constipation idiopathic diagnosed in the past and there was just nothing i could do about it and other than the uh more advice from the doctor doctors was eat more fiber eat more fiber and then only when i removed all the fiber from the diet the, the constipation resolved itself to never come back it was actually so profound that it's it's a typical thing with pregnancies that women experience constipation and um while i wasn't plant based with my first child i, I had that experience myself However, after my first child I went full carnivore and and uh pretty much got through my pregnancy uh, the first trimester with the second pregnancy I was full, 100% carnivore then I started doing a little bit of dairy uh, dairy was also carnivore but I was more in PKD I was doing dairy and some fruit mostly because my child was moving to to uh too much and so one way in midwifery to make the child grow faster you eat more fructose so interesting things so, so when midwives once you make your baby a, a bigger faster they make you eat a lot of fruit that also speaks to <laughs> high fructose corn syrup being in a, in everything so so that was my second pregnancy but there was no constipation once it got healed with carnivore diet it went away even when i added fruit uh it did not have the same effect of my gut microbiome as to co- uh, cause this constipation that i couldn't resolve with any means uh that were were available to me uh other thing i was dealing with was uh, allergies again it was for, for uh, in today's society is just almost expected or things like bloating after uh lunch or dinner do you just understand that that's how it is well that's go that goes away with the carnivore diet you never you never get bloated allergies resolve themselves as your gut uh, permeability uh, goes away your allergies will go go away 
and a lot of skin issues will go away as well. I wouldn't say that you know it's a you know carnivore diet is a golden it's a, it's a panacea for everything that wouldn't be an accurate uh, statement but it is a foundation of a human diet if it's not 100% we should prioritize it a minimum 80% there should be uh, red meat eggs butter cheeses uh, should be part of our diet not the other way around I would say no. I'll add also some of the so social changes is, you know, we cook a lot more at, uh, at home, which adds to a healthier uh, way of uh, eating by itself because you know what you are eating. Um, yeah, eating out is, is just went away and it's much more. It's more of a, it's, that might be sometimes the social difficulty when your friends want to hang out and go different places, different restaurants, and, you know, you, you can't quite eat the Mexican cuisine or, you know, no chance for Indian food, stuff like that. Um, but other than that, overall, your, uh, my health just increased so much more uh, that I have no regrets. When I was getting, when I was, before my first uh, child, I, I had all my hormones tested. And the interesting thing is, I have my kids almost three and a half years apart. My fertility got better as I got older after a couple of years of carnivore diet. So a typical thing is that your, uh, there is a hormone measure called anti-Mullerian hormone, MAH, and that's your ovarian reserve. And it says it declines for women no matter what you do, you know, especially after you turn 38, it's like a nosedive of uh, MAH. So after it was, it was four years of uh, three, three, four years of carnivore diet, my uh, MAH actually increased. But the conventional belief is that uh, you, once you start losing MAH, that's it. You, 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 it's downhill. But I had the higher MA, uh, uh, MAH at 41 than I had at 36. Wow. That's, uh, that's very interesting. If I were to coach uh, women for optimal fertility, prioritize red meat, saturated fats, uh, not a lot of uh, not a lot of alcohol, coffee. Uh, there's no benefits to alcohol. So uh, unless you really have like some sort of a social or like that's your way to relax. Uh, okay, here and there, but really no function in life uh, benefits for for health. But minimize coffee, teas, all those herbal things that we we're told that they're great for us. Mm -mm. Prioritize clean water, meat, fat, quality salt, all the fancy stuff, keep it at bay as an occasional thing and your fertility will increase significantly. So Sylvia, do you have a YouTube channel? Yeah, yes, it is a big city mom. It started as a, the objective of the channel at first was to bring back the traditional ways to a modern life. So whatever I remembered from my rural uh, life in Poland was to, you know, how I bring it to my children here in the middle of New York City, because they don't have the lived experience that I had. So I wanted to leave a legacy that when they grow up and they have, you know, they're looking for ways to improve their life, where would they go if I'm not there? Where would they find it? So I started a sort of a, a, a kind of working mom strategies for better health, better lifestyle in wherever you are. And then as one of those strategies, carnivore diet was, uh, was my topic, but then it became so popular and people started reaching out that the, the channel kind of went in more carnivore diet and carnival living direction and all associated types of diets. Like some people will reach out to me just to do very low carb or they want specifically the paleo ketogenic diet. So believe it or not, there's many different versions and variations of the uh, carnivore diet. And, uh, and there's also people respond to it in so many different ways. So you really have to be attentive and um, tune in to a particular uh, person to really uh, uh, design the diet well for them. But essentially, it started as a healthy living, whatever lifestyle in, in the modern world. And it, it kind of morphed into mo mostly carnival content. Nice. Well, I'll, uh, I'll link to that in the description. And Sylvia, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story with us. I really appreciate it. Sure. It's my pleasure. It was great chatting with you.